This is a cardiology podcast for finals. It's not going to focus on the examination of the cardiovascular system. That's a separate video uh, in itself. We're going to be looking at the diseases, uh, particularly the main ones that the examiners like to choose. And those are probably uh, defined as the acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, atrial fibrillation and valvular pathologies. So... The first main question, uh, if we start with atrial fibrillation, or what are the causes of atrial fibrillation? And these can be categorised into hypertension, COPD, myocardial infarction, hyperthyroidism from a, a, a you'd be thyrotoxic will cause atrial fibrillation, structural abnormalities of the atria, uh, COPD, so pulmonary disease as well can cause it. You can also have iatrogenic causes and drug treatments, uh, ischemic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, cancer and a left atrial myxoma are all causes of atrial fibrillation. There are two main explanations uh, of an irregularly irregular pulse. Uh, one would be there are multiple ectopics and AF and how you would maybe uh, distinguish it uh, is exacerbate, you know, exacerbate it so you would exercise the patient. Um, ectopics will go away and you will have a regular rhythm and AF is will will just go faster um, and heart block uh, so first second third degree heart block is, is is usually slow so if you didn't have an ECG that would be a good way of uh, of differentiating those things there are two main considerations when looking at atrial fibrillation the first one is rate control and the second one is rhythm control and then I suppose all of this is related to the patient's symptoms and you would maybe tell the examiner that you would time the apical rate with my stethoscope um, and if less than 100 uh, that's fairly good and if it's greater than 100 that's fairly bad that's a very broad characterization but the the two um, controls um, of atrial fibrillation should be classified into rhythm and rate control if you can control the rhythm so it's not an AF and you get P waves back that is good and if you cannot do that rate control should be satisfactory uh, getting the heart rate below 100 is important and that is because the heart only perfuses itself during diastole. So the slower the heart, uh, within reason, uh, the better the perfusion of the heart is. So let's talk a bit more about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation uh, is characterised by palpitations and an irregularly irregular pulse. And the person who presents with it will have a history of hypertension, ischemia or cardiomyopathy. You'll do an initial ECG. Um, and if that doesn't show the answer, if that doesn't show you your absence of P waves in an irregular, irregular rhythm, uh, they should be put on telemetry. Uh, outpatient uh, monitoring could undergo 24-hour ECG, uh, and that allows them to walk around and it will record their rhythm. They, they would have to be cardiovascularly stable for that um, to do. Tests you might want to do in somebody who is having an acute uh, onset of, of palpitations and potentially a bit of pain is a troponin. You have to exclude the fact that they might be having um, a cardiac event. You might want to do their electrolytes, check their magnesium, their potassium levels, uh, and also their calcium levels. You want to do thyroid function testing in these people, test their TSH and T4, make sure they're not thyrotoxic. Uh, and also you'd want to book them in for an echo, uh, a cardiac echo. You'd want to look for clots within the atria, because if you convert the, the atrial fibrillation, if it's longer than you know, a 24 hour um, onset, you can dislodge that clot within the atria and it can go into the brain and cause a stroke. This will also, the echo will also look at left atrial size, valve function and ejection fraction within the heart, so it's very useful in somebody with, um, with heart disease. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to CHADS score them. So CHADS stands for C, which is CHS, so congestive heart failure, if they've got a history of congestive heart failure. H is hypertension. A is age, greater than 75. D is for diabetes, S is for stroke or TIA, and if you have a score of 0 to 1, you need aspirin. Uh, if you've got two or more, you might have to consider using warfarin or any of the um, direct-acting uh, oral anticoagulants, such as rivaroxaban, apexaban, dabigatran, and you can use warfarin. Uh, I think cardiologists are going towards the, um, the they were previously called NOACs, the novel oral anticoagulants. Questions remain in AF, really, if you had an unstable patient. So an unstable patient is characterised by shock, uh, declining GCS, uh, worsening pulmonary edema from heart failure. 
um, if they're going very fast and that's compromising their blood pressure uh, they should undergo immediate synchronized DC cardioversion and they should um, have that done as soon as possible. I think the best way to characterize an unstable patient uh, cardiovascularly is this systolic blood pressure less than 90. They've got signs of heart failure and a decrease in GCS and confusion and chest pain. So those four main things will um, will show you that the person is becoming more unstable. So that is a systolic blood pressure less than 90, congestive heart failure, uh, signs of that pulmonary edema, for example, and confusion with really low GCS and chest pain, four things. Stable patients uh, should first have their rate slowed down. So there is rate control and there's rhythm control considerations in the atrial fibrillation. So stable patients should have their ventricular rate slowed down if it is above 100 they want to be slowed down to below 100. Rate control medications um, for atrial fibrillation are beta blockers and in the immediate term in hospital that might be esmolol which is a very fast acting um, beta blocker but it doesn't last very long and metoprolol it doesn't last very long either and they are given in small amounts to test their effect and the benefit of them is they wear off quite quickly but also that's the limitation of them. Further treatment with beta blockers might include something like bisoprolol, which is a selective beta blocker, and you can give that between 2.5 and 5 milligrams, for example, orally, but it takes longer to work, so you don't get rapid rhythm control, and it lasts for a longer period of time. The second um, method of control is using calcium channel blockers, such as diltiazem, or you can use digoxin. Uh, all of these can be given intravenously, apart from bisoprolol, uh, which is a further, um, which is a an agent down the line, um, and you can also consider giving these patients magnesium, um, which can actually cardiovert them as well, as because it stabilizes the cardiac membrane. So once your rate's been controlled, you need to anticoagulate these people because they have risks of having clots in their atria, as we've already discussed. So you anticoagulate them with um, a pexaban, a bigotran, warfarin or something similar if they're taking oral medications or you give them therapeutic doses of uh, low molecular weight heparin like an oxaparin uh, if the arrhythmia has persisted beyond two days and this is because you're going to try to um, change their you're going to try to change their rhythm uh, depending on what the rate is you can try to convert them with drugs like amiodarone uh, you can also try to convert them with various other medications, but uh, the main uh, stay of treatment is actually rate control mechanisms, uh, such as what we've discussed, metoprolol, the tiazem, digoxin, combined with anticoagulation. Um, and it's actually, the, the effect of these long-term use of the rate control medications uh, combined with anticoagulation is equal or better than cardioversion. Uh, with the electricity or medications so rate control is very important and that is probably in long term because of the heart only perfusing during diastole and if your heart is going fast for a long period of time it will eventually wear out and cause heart failure uh, the target INR for warfarin for these patients might be somewhere between 2 and 3 and uh, this once again is for an atrial arrhythmia persisting beyond 2 days Routine cardioversion of atrial fibrillation is usually not no longer indicated unless the patient is symptomatic. So if they are rate controlled properly and they are asymptomatic of their AF, uh, then routine cardioversion is usually not indicated. However, these patients should be routinely reviewed by their GP and cardiologist. You should not prescribe beta blockers and verapamil together. This comes up in exams. You should not prescribe beta blockers and verapamil together because they can cause heart block. The reason why fast AF or any fast rhythm in the heart is bad, and I keep mentioning this in different videos, but uh, the faster the heart is beating, the less the heart can perfuse during diastole because that's when it perfuses. The second reason is if it's going that fast, there's actually inadequate time for the heart to fill. Therefore, you will get a weak pulse and there's no pressure um, produced. This is um, whenever you palpate the um, 
palpate the pulse, you will feel a weak but fast pulse, uh, which indicates poor cardiac output, and that is reflected in the other organs, and that's what can cause um, the damage. Further questions about atrial fibrillation in finals might come whenever they're talking about warfarin. So if they're talking about warfarin, they might ask you what level of INR you would aim for. I've already said between two and three. But if they had a mechanical prosthetic valve, for example, you would aim for three to four. And that's INR. In our next section here, we're going to talk about valvular uh, heart disease. We're talking about systolic murmurs and diastolic murmurs. Systolic murmurs uh, are aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, mitral valve prolapse, and HOCAM, which stands for Hypertrophic Obstructive Cardiomyopathy. Diastolic murmurs are most commonly aortic regurg and mitral stenosis. All murmurs that are right-sided in the heart increase with intensity with inhalation, and that is because the right side of the heart is intrinsically connected to your pulmonary vasculature and all left-sided murmurs increase with exhalation, so breathing out. So if you breathe in, the right-sided murmurs get worse, and whenever you breathe out, the left-sided murmurs get worse, and you can hear them better. So whenever you think about mitral and aortic valve lesions, they are best heard on exhalation, and tricuspid regurge, and stiffness or stenosis or sclerosis of the tricuspid valve which is associated with intravenous drug use will be heard best on inhalation whenever the lungs are filled up maximally because whenever the lungs are filled up maximally the pressure of the lungs forces all their all their blood back into the right side of the heart which makes the the mechanical movement across the valve more and you'll be able to hear it better it's probably worth noting uh, the effects of a change in venous return to the heart whenever it comes to murmurs. So, in my mind, there are seven major murmurs. There's aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, a ventricular septal defect, not really a valve disorder, but still causes murmur, and hokum and mitral valve prolapse. Whenever you squat, or you do a passive leg raise in a patient where the patient's lying flat and you raise their legs up, you increase the venous return to the heart. So there's more blood going into the heart. Whenever you do Valsalva, which is where they're standing, and they expire against a closed glottis, so they're increasing endothoracic pressure and they decrease venous return to the heart. In most cases, this will, whenever you increase the venous return to the heart with a squat or a leg raise, it will increase the sound of the murmur. Whenever you do Valsalva, it will decrease the sound of the murmur. In all cases, apart from hokum, hyperobstructive cardiomyopathy, the murmur will decrease whenever you increase the venous return. So if you increase venous return in a person with hokum, their murmur will decrease. Whenever you do Valsalva and decrease the venous return um, going to the heart, it will increase the murmur sound. In mitral valve prolapse, it will do the same, um, and it will also so therefore it will decrease whenever you uh, whenever you increase the venous return to the heart, and it will increase in sound whenever you decrease the venous return to the heart. There are four main murmurs that you should really know off by heart for your finals exam. They are aortic stenosis and aortic regurge and they are mitral regurge and mitral stenosis. Aortic stenosis is a systolic murmur and aortic regurge is a diastolic murmur. Mitral regurge is a systolic murmur and mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur. We'll start with aortic stenosis which is a systolic murmur. The causes of this is whenever the aortic valve becomes very calcified or you have a congenital bicuspid valve, the aortic valve should be tricuspid, and 40% of aortic stenosis is caused by rheumatic fever. Their um, presented complaint can be uh, syncope, angina, or dyspnea. They can also be complaining of heart failure because the valve is too stiff and this causes enlargement and hypertrophy of the heart. 
if they get syncope with exer exertion, this is also um, a factor that points towards aortic stenosis, and you should be able to look for an echo um, to actually see um, the patency of the valve. And clinical signs would be a slow rising pulse and a narrow pulse pressure. The JVP will be normal. There will be a thrill if you feel over the aortic uh, area and you'll have a forceful non-displaced non apex beat. As I said, you'll have an ejection systolic murmur, and this is because the heart, uh, as it pumps, will build up pressure behind that stiff, non-compliant aortic valve, and then suddenly it will burst open. The sound will radiate into the carotids, and you'll have a loud sound uh, in the aortic area. Investigation and management, ECG, you will see notched P waves, left ventricular hypertrophy, particular in V5 and V6. You'll see left bundle branch block, AV block because of the calcification. In chest x-ray you might see left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomegaly or a calcified valve, which will stand out as, as um, bright and white on a chest x-ray. An echo, as I said, is diagnostic for aortic stenosis. Um, and just for a bit of extra extra credit, a P gradient of greater than 50 would mean that um, the gradient across the valve is severe. And a valvular area of less than half a centimetre squared, which is 0 0.5 centimetre squared, is bad. If you were to do a cardiac catheter, uh, you would look at LV function and you would look at coronary disease as well. There is a risk of sudden death with aortic stenosis and an ejection systolic murmur uh, is common uh, in, in high cardiac output states uh, or in a state where you have a high heart rate uh, or you're pregnant. It's also um, an ejection systolic murmur can be common in hokum, hyperobstructive cardiomyopathy and pulmonary stenosis as well. And the treatment for it uh, is to monitor if it's not very bad, um, but if they're symptomatic and it's getting worse, you need to replace the valve. The second systolic murmur is mitral regurgitation. This is a pan-systolic murmur. It happens throughout systole. 70% of the cases of mitral regurg are caused by rheumatic fever. Uh, or endocarditis, infective endocarditis. It will cause left ventricular dilatation um, or an MI has caused valve prolapse by snapping the heart strings and allowing the mitral valve to fall back down um, causing it to essentially flap in, the, flap in the flow of blood. The presenting complaint of people with mitral regurgitation is they have palpitations, they have atrial fibrillation. They will have increasing shortness of breath, they will be fatigued. They might have, if they do have infective endocarditis, they might have fever weight loss and clubbing. They could have heart failure, congestive cardiac failure with pulmonary edema, orthopnea, ankle swelling and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. The clinical signs of mitral regurg would be an irregular pulse uh, if they do have AF and a displaced apex beat so the, the heart is thrusting towards you whenever you listen or feel at the apex. So this is a pan systolic murmur as we've said. It radiates to the axilla. It is loud uh, whenever you roll them on their side, it gets louder, and whenever you make them do Valsalva, which is the expiration against a closed glottis, reducing venous return to the heart, uh, it will make it louder as well because the valve is prolapsing. You'll have typically a soft first heart sound and uh, potentially a split second heart sound. You might hear a gallop rhythm, it might be a third heart sound. The other investigations would be chest x-ray, you'd see left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomegaly, a calcified valve. Echo would show, uh, would be diagnostic and it would show the size of regurgitation jet uh, measured so as the, as the regurg drops down into the left ventricle you would be able to see um, that with a Doppler effect on, on the echo probe. If you were to do a cardiac catheter, you would assess LV function and you would query coronary disease, see if they've had an MI that's caused that um, mitral valve prolapse. And you treat the AF with beta blockers and calcium channel blockers that controls the rate. You can convert them with digoxin. You can anticoagulate them with aspirin and warfarin, uh, Noax, Dibigatran, etc. If you're treating infective endocarditis, you would treat with um, antibiotics such as benzyl penicillin, which entomycin intravenously. And uh, if you do hear a pansystolic murmur, you should consider a ventricular septal defect or tricuspid regurgitation. 
Now in the first diastolic murmur we're going to talk about is aortic regurgitation and that's a diastolic murmur uh, caused by rheumatic fever, Marfan syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. It can also be caused by infective endocarditis and this is an incompetent floppy valve, floppy aorta allowing the blood uh, that would normally be trapped whenever the aorta closes to fall back down into the heart. This person will have a decreased cardiac output and they'll be short of breath with heart failure and they'll have chest pain. Uh, they will have a collapsing pulse whenever you bring their wrist up. Uh, it will fall back down because all the blood's falling back down into the column, all the way back down your arm, through the artery, back down through the aorta, through the aortic valve and back into the heart. It has a wide pulse pressure, which means the blood pressure will be very different systolic to diastolic. JVP will be normal and your apex beat will be displaced. This is an early diastolic murmur, so it's heard early in diastole, just after the S2 heart sound. And it's heard best whenever you lean the patient forward in expiration. Do you remember we talked about in what heart sounds are heard best on inspiration and expiration. Everything on the uh, left uh, side of the heart is heard best in expiration. And you would investigate aortic regurg with an ECG. You might see left ventricular hypertrophy, particularly in V5 and V6. This is similar to anything with the aorta. Uh, you see aortic stenosis um, with left ventricular hypertrophy best in V5 and V6. On a chest x-ray, you might see cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema, and if you were to do a cardiac catheter, you would assess their left ventricular function, coronary disease, and look at the aortic root to see uh, what it looks like. The treatment for left ventricular hypertrophy is diuretic, such as furosemide, spironolactone, uh, etc. And you would use an ACE inhibitor, beta blockers as cardio protection for heart failure, and you would replace the valve. Essentially, any valve which is bad enough uh, should be replaced and you would refer this person to a cardiac surgeon. Mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur and it can lead to tricuspid regurg which would increase your jugular venous pressure, your JVP. Mitral stenosis can be congenital or it can be acquired via rheumatic fever. It causes uh, shortness of breath uh, through pulmonary edema. It causes a cough plus or minus blood it causes palpitations such as AF, it causes angina and heart failure. These patients with mitral stenosis get a malar flush in the cheeks. They have a tapping apex beat that is not displaced and they have left atrial failure and this gives you pulmonary edema. This is a mid-diastolic murmur heard halfway between uh, S2 and the repeat S1. So it will be loudest at the apex of the heart and you will have a loud S1 with an opening snap because the valve is stiff so it's got that opening snap uh, to it. And you will see on an ECG you will see AF, a notched P wave, right ventricular hypertrophy or strain or a right axis deviation. On a chest x-ray you'll see a big left atrium and pulmonary edema. You would echo these people because it's diagnostic to see the, the valve gradients. The treatment for mitral stenosis is obviously to replace the valve. You can use balloon valvuloplasty in these patients, but uh, in terms of pharmacological control, you would anticoagulate these people. Uh, you would control their AF rate control as a matter of urgency. Uh, you would give them diuretic to reduce their preload to the heart. Uh, this might also reduce the pulmonary edema effects, so it reduces the strain in the heart. Um, and then really, as with all of these things, you would uh, replace the valve if it's, getting, if it's getting worse. So of all of these, mitral regurg is potentially one of the most common ones for final exams. Uh, these patients are more likely to be in sinus. Um, the disease itself is more common than mitral stenosis uh, because mitral regurg can happen after myocardial infarction. It's easier to detect because the apex beat is usually displaced uh, due to volume overload. The, you will feel the apex beat more laterally. Uh, you have a quiet first heart sound. A pan systolic murmur is much easier to hear uh, for students. Uh, it will radiate loudly to the axilla and the second heart sound uh, is not heard separately. So essentially you get this, this burr, the mitral regurgis is, is a long pan systolic murmur, the burr noise, there's no gap between the murmur 
and the first and second heart sound so first heart sounds quiet and you get this burr sound and it sort of masks the uh, the second heart sound so all in all mitral regurg is very common and aortic regurg uh, is nearly always rheumatic in origin so with the declining amounts of rheumatic fever in our population it's not really uh, seen very much um, but everything we've we've said about aortic regurg where it being a diastolic murmur you see it in marfans rheumatoid arthritis infective endocarditis with that early diastolic murmur the collapsing pulse it's very typical to be asked about but you probably will not see very many patients uh, with aortic regurg as i said mitral regurg it's probably the easiest one for the examiners to get let's move on to talk about myocardial infarction myocardial infarction uh, should be divided into where you think the infarct has occurred so in textbooks uh, this can be divided into the leads on an ECG. If you're looking, let's take the, the main coronary artery, the left main stem. Uh, if if you had an infarction there, uh, it would most likely kill you, give you cardiogenic shock and um, destroy most of your heart. Because the left main stem leads into the left circumflex and the left anterior descending. And the right coronary artery goes right in its really on its own. So the left main stem will likely kill you. You will give a large anterior MI that is most likely seen in V2 to V6. A left anterior descending, uh, which branches off the left main stem, will give you an anteroseptal infarct, an anteroseptal infarct, and that will be best seen in V2 to V4. The left circumflex uh, would give you an anterolateral infarct, and it would be best seen in leads 1, AVL and V4 to 6. If you had a right coronary artery uh, infarction, this would give you an inferior MI and this would be seen best in leads 2, 3 and AVF because AVF looks uh, inferiorly. Bradyarrhythmias would be common with a right coronary artery infarct because uh, you are affecting the nodes because the right coronary artery supplies the nodes that um, propagate um, the heartbeat. So you would get bradyarrhythmias and if those nodes are blocked your heart slows down. The examiner might ask you what are the complications of a myocardial infarct. This would be a very common exam question and I use a mnemonic. Uh, a mnemonic to remember it called act rapid as in the insulin act rapid so act rapid stands for a which is arrhythmia such as svt ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation the c stands for congestive cardiac failure the t could stand for tamponade or thromboembolic disorders the r will stand for rupture of the ventricle septum or papillary muscle a stands for aneurysm of the ventricle, so you can have a ventricular aneurysm uh, with the cell death there. You can get pericarditis, that's the P. Infarction is the I, like another infarction after, after, a, um, after an MI. And the D stands for either Dressler syndrome or death. Dressler syndrome happens in about 1 in 400 patients. Uh, it's an immune response and you'll get an elevated uh, ESR and CRP and pericardial type of pain. So it is essentially an immune uh, response uh, and an inflammatory pericarditis. You can also have acute early pericarditis. It's very common uh, post-MI. About 19 out of 20 of those, however, will have no rub whenever you listen. Um, and you ask the patient, has your pain changed? Has anything, has anything been affected? Has anything changed in your pain? Uh, and they might have signs of pericarditis, which are worse than sitting forward. And this would be relieved by non-steroidals and something like that. Pericardial pain has, has uh, six main features. It is uh, rel relieved by sitting forward it is worse lying flat it radiates to the shoulder not the arm uh, you'll get central chest pain and it's worse on inspiration and it is sharp so let's go over those again uh, the act rapid mnemonic that's act r-a-p-i-d and that's for arrhythmias congestive cardiac failure tamponade or thromboembolic disorders rupture of the ventricle septum or papillary muscles aneurysm pericarditis infarction or death or Dressler syndrome and very quickly Dressler syndrome is simply 
injury to the heart muscle that causes blood to be present in the pericardium. This causes pericarditis and it is an immune mediated response. So it's an inflamed pericardium secondary to blood being present in the pericardium. Signs and symptoms of Dresler syndrome, uh, which is also known as post-myocardial infarct syndrome or post-pericardotomy pericarditis. It will occur two to 10 weeks post-myocardial infarction. You'll have a persistent low-grade fever with chest pain that's pleuritic in nature, pericarditis, a friction rub on exam. It usually resolves spontaneously, but if not, you can use steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Moving on now to congestive heart failure. Uh, if you hear that the patient is presenting with a history of hypertension, valvular heart disease and myocardial infarction, you should be considering congestive heart failure. It presents with shortness of breath, particularly on exertion in a person with edema, creps on lung examination, ascites, JVP distension, an S3 gallop sound whenever you're listening to their heart sounds and it sounds like a splash, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. This person will be fatigued if they have congestive heart failure. It's worse than exertion. You may then be asked about acute pulmonary edema. So the mainstay of therapy for acute pulmonary edema remains to be oxygen, diuresis with furosemide, nitrate therapy and morphine. Nitrates and morphine uh, improve symptom relief. They improve, uh, the, they dilate up the coronary vessels um, and they also reduce preload to the heart. Furosemide offload, it reduces preload by actually removing water from your blood and therefore reducing preload and oxygen because their lungs are full with water and they have probably an oxygen deficit and they have a cardiac they have cardiac failure so their cardiac output's poor and therefore their perfusion to organs might might be poor as well. These treatments are not associated with any real mortality benefit in the long term, but they are uh, the standard of care that is expected uh, for an acute um, um, pulmonary edema episode. Essentially, if you remove volume from uh, the heart, the preload, um, it will stay away from the lungs and therefore will not uh, offload water uh, into the lungs. So pulmonary edema is a clinical diagnosis. It is uh, shortness of breath, craps on examination, that S3 sound and orthopnea. And there's no single test that can actually uh, determine whether somebody is in um, pulmonary edema um, you can't just determine it by x-ray alone, you have to use a combination of, of clinical uh, skills to actually determine whether somebody is overloaded. Nevertheless, the examiner will turn to you and say, which tests would you like to do on this patient? And you will say, I want a chest x-ray to check for pulmonary vascular congestion, uh, for upper lobe diversion, for uh, effusion, for pleural effusion, for cardiomegaly. And there are signs on chest x-ray in keeping with uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, that can be divided into A, B, C, D, and we will talk about that in another another video. But uh, you would look for the pulmonary vascular congestion. You would look for uh, opacities within the lung that looks like patchy consolidation throughout um, bilateral lung fields um, to confirm your suspicions. You would also do an ECG. You might see a sinus tachycardia uh, accompanying either an atrial or ventricular arrhythmia. You might also see right heart strain. Uh, in somebody with heart failure. You might also see different ECG patterns from previous MIs such as um, such as um, pathological Q waves, uh, left or right bundle branch block. You want to put these people um, on a pulse oximeter um, because you want to see how epoxic they are and you'd want to do an ABG on this person to check for uh, a number of different things. Um, you would want to check their PO2, you want to check their PCO2 to check if there were any types of respiratory failure evident. Uh, if they were very tachypneic this can induce a metabolic, uh, respiratory, pardon me, uh, alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis um, that might be result, uh, might be induced from having low levels of CO2 um, to compensate for hypoxia uh, with that increased um, respiratory rate. You'd also want to do a diagnostic echo. Um, it's not particularly diagnostic for uh, pulmonary edema. However, it will show systolic function and diastolic function or 
more importantly, dysfunction uh, of the heart. It will also show ejection fraction and whether there is dilation in the right side of the heart, if it's overfilled, if they're stretched. Clues on inspection for acute uh, left ventricular failure or pulmonary edema is just set. The patient looks unwell. They look pale and grey. They may look pale and grey. They will be cold preferably. They may be cyanotic if they're hypoxic. They will have that frothy blood-stained sputum in the sputum pot. Uh, they'll be orthopnic and they might have a cardiac wheeze, that cardiac asthma due to the overload, the fluid being trapped in their lungs. You'll get venous congestion, bronchial congestion, and the veins might be standing out in the neck, and the JVP might be increased due to the right atrial pressures being increased. If the right atrial pressures are increased, that will transmit up the neck veins into the uh, internal jugular and cause those that JVP distension. If the examiner does ask you what are the chest x-ray signs in left ventricular failure, um, basically meaning what are the signs in pulmonary edema, you would use the A, B, C, D, E approach. A for alveolar, alveolar edema, which is also called batwing edema. The curly B lines is the B, which is a sign of interstitial edema. You would see cardiomegaly for C. For D, you would see diversion of the upper lobes, and that means the upper lobe vessels in the lungs are prominent. And you would also see pleural effusion, that's the E, so that's your A, B, C, D, E of chest x-ray features for pulmonary edema, left ventricular failure. A very useful way of classifying uh, heart failure and angina is with the New York Heart Association grading, the New York Heart Association classification system. And if you're going to talk about this, you need to talk, you need to use the buzzword functional capacity. If they have no symptoms, but they have heart failure and you've proven it in other ways, uh, they get a one. So there's none. So it's a, a no grading. Uh, the second one would be mild, which would be symptoms of mild breathlessness, mild angina on exertion during ordinary physical activity. Moderate heart failure would be marked breathlessness or angina on walking short distances, such as less than 100 metres, so less than ordinary activity, this is moderate. And severe heart failure would be classified as breathless at rest. This is a good um, way of, of uh, defining functional capacity and actually sounds really good if you're able to talk about it in, in the exam. So there are none mild, moderate and severe as classifications, starting with no symptoms to severe as breathless at rest. The last thing I want to talk about in this particular uh, video is uh, the very common uh, exam questions about hyperkalemia and ECG changes. So a bit of a background to this. Potassium is vital for regulating the normal electrical activity of the heart. Increased extracellular potassium reduces myocardial excitability and depresses both pacemaking and conductive tissues. Progressively worsening hyperkalemia leads to suppression of impulse generation by the sinoatrial node and reduce conduction by the AV node and the his Purkinje system. This results in a bradycardia and conduction blocks and will eventually um, give you a cardiac arrest. So hyperkalemia is defined as a potassium level greater than 5.5, uh, that's milliequivalents per litre, all of these are milliequivalents per litre. Moderate hyperkalemia is a serum potassium greater than 6 and a severe hyperkalemia is a serum potassium greater than 7. So the effects of hyperkalemia on the ECG, essentially if you have a potassium greater than 5.5, now, with a bit of background to this, we aim all patients in intensive care to have a serum potassium of 4.5. So, a serum potassium greater than 5.5 is literally at least 1 milli equivalent per litre greater than what we would aim um, to have a normal uh, electrolyte um, profile to enable good conduction in the heart. With a serum potassium greater than 5.5, you will have repolarization abnormalities. And this is peaked T waves, which is usually the earliest sign of hyperkalemia. So, peaked T waves. And if you have a serum potassium greater than 6.5, this is associated with progressive paralysis of the atria. This means that your P wave widens and flattens, so you'll have small, low, flat P waves. At this stage, when the serum potassium is, is greater than 6.5 also, you will have PR segments that are lengthier, so the PR segments get longer, and the P waves eventually disappear um, as serum potassium increases at serum potassium levels greater than 7, 
you will get conduction abnormalities and a bradycardia and this is how, how you get the bizarre QRS uh, complexes the the broad bizarre QRS complexes You'll also get an AV block with a slow junctional and ventricular escape rhythms. And any kind of conduction block, such as bundle branch blocks, vesicular blocks, can happen at this stage too. You can have a slow AF. Don't forget your P waves eventually disappear. You get paralysis of the atria. Um, so you can get a slow AF and a sinus bradycardia. And a, a, a very malignant sign uh, at, at extreme potassium levels is you get a sine wave appearance uh, of the ECG, that's very bad. In serum levels greater than nine, this will cause a cardiac arrest, and this will be due to asystole, ventricular fibrillation, or PEA with bizarre wide complex rhythms. Some good tips are to suspect hyperkalemia in any patient with a new bradyarrhythmia or AV block, especially patients with renal failure, even if they're even if they're on hemodialysis or taking any combination of ACE inhibitors. Um, so ACE inhibitors, potassium sparing diuretics and potassium supplements always suspect hyperkalemia. And we manage hyperkalemia uh, in a very algorithmic way now. Every ward will have a hyperkalemia kit. And you should mention this in your exam if your examiner asks you about this. We have hyperkalemia kits. This is um, a, a, a good OSCE station if ever there was one. Um, and the, the first thing is to arrange an ECG monitor and you get the resus equipment to the bed uh, if the person's unwell and you do their OBS and vital signs, etc. like their blood pressure, their the pulse ox. The first thing you do is establish IV access using a large bore cannula and you give 10% calcium gluconate. You give this because it stabilizes the myocardium. You then give a mixture of glucose and insulin. The reason you give the glucose is because the insulin will drop the sugars, but you don't need the sugars to drop because you're not using insulin for that reason. You're using insulin because insulin via the insulin pump will drive potassium into the cells where it can't harm anything, can't do anything bad. So if it forces it into the cells, uh, because potassium is, 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 is majoritively an intracellular cation, it's a major intracellular cation, it needs to be inside the cells. So if you're using insulin, it forces the potassium back into the cells where it can't be of any harm um, and therefore will reduce your serum potassium levels back to normal. The other thing you need to mention is you need to recheck the UE um, every, every two hours um, until. You know, it is sorted, and a quick way uh, to check a serum potassium is to do an ABG or a VBG if it's if it's easier. Usually VBGs because you don't need an arterial sample; you need a venous sample to give um, an accurate potassium level. And you can check um, on the ABG um, quite rapidly. Um, you probably will have already done this if you're suspecting hyperkalemia.